So uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining uh, for our Northern California Society for Clinical Gastroenterology 2020-2021 uh, webinar series. The goal is to advance career development in GI and hepatology care. Uh, first of all, some of the instructions most of you are aware about since we all have been using Zoom every day now that uh, mute function is right on uh, the microphone on your phone or computer. Please make sure that you are muted uh, to ensure the faculty can be clearly heard. Um, if there's a background noise, it would be very hard for uh, all the participants to hear. Uh, if you wanted to enable the video by the click uh, icon before uh, below. If you wanted to ask a question, uh, feel free to use the chat option. Uh, post your question throughout the lecture. I'll uh, make sure that all the questions that have been, uh, uh, I can ask at the end. Uh, please note that when you write a question, uh, everyone can review uh, or read your questions. So just wanted to make sure. I also, if you, uh, pref you know, ideally, if you can just uh, make sure that we got your name right uh, for our purpose. So if you are using some other name or just please rename, and this is very easy, right click on the option on the participant and you can put your uh, full names so that we can uh, copy. And if you ask a question, I can, uh, you know, uh, make sure that uh, we know who is asking the question. Uh, this is luckily, uh, thanks to our team, uh, now you can also claim a CME credit. Uh, it's a one CME. In order to claim the CME, you must complete the following after each webinar. Uh, so you have to fill out the evaluation form and post test. The link uh, to the survey will be sent to the email address you have used for the registration purposes. If you're not sure which email address you use to register, please send us an email at the email uh, which is listed on the slide. Your program evaluation form and request for your CMB certificate will be processed by our CMB provider. It will gonna take via email approximately four to six weeks uh, post completion of the series. To obtain CME credit, you must complete a pre-test, a post-test and evaluation. The post-test link will be emailed to you after the conference. You can access the pre-test now. If you are just don't aware, you, it was already emailed to you, but if you're not, by ex uh, you can use the site or just by scanning the image below with your smartphone camera. So I would just give a few seconds. So if someone needs to use this uh, to scan uh, from the smartphone, and please do the pre-test so that you can get the CME credit after you complete the post-test link. Again, um, there's an online evaluation form to claim the CME credit. And you can also find the evaluation form at our website, uh, which is mentioned here. If you're not sure which email address you registered, uh, please uh, just send us an email and we can correct that. Uh, one other thing for the fellows, which we are very exciting that we wanted uh, for the fellows to replicate a meal we would have together for this future meeting. So our society would like to offer uh, all the fellows who attend the webinars a meal up to the value of $30 to be eaten at the time of the webinar and all the future webinars. But in order to receive uh, the free meal during the webinar, you have to follow these easy steps Ensure that you are a uh, fellow with our society. It's free of cost. You may register or renew your membership. Attend the webinar, attendance is monitored. Order your meal for the time of the webinar up to the value of $30 and please save the receipt. Please turn on your webcam so that we can connect as we dine, converse and collaborate and learn together during the program. Fill in the expense reimbursement form emailed after the event and submit this along with your receipt to Denny, and this is the email which you're getting all the emails from her. You will receive a check for the value of your meal up to $30 mailed to you shortly after the event. So we're very excited about this opportunity for our fellows because I know how much hard work you guys are doing every day and even after your hard day, you're uh, able to attend these webinars. We wanted to acknowledge the following uh, our supporters and uh, for the grant support for their educational activities grant in support 
of this activity, uh, Ferring Pharmaceutical, Mellencroft Pharmaceutical, and Takeda Pharmaceuticals. So uh, tonight uh, we have a talk uh, to approach to acute kidney injury in patient with cirrhosis by Dr. Uh, you know, Joe Colaro, who is uh, Assistant Professor in Transplant Hepatology at University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Joe um, has done um, his uh, uh, GI training at University of California, San Francisco, went for a year to Columbia for transplant and came back to us and we are very excited and happy to have him. Uh, his main interest is actually understanding uh, chronic kidney disease and uh, renal disease in patients with end-stage liver disease and make it understandable to us. And, you know, uh, since Joe has a fellow, I have got to know much more about the kidneys than I ever been. So I'm very excited for him to give this talk. However, there are a lot of other webinars uh, from our series coming soon. Uh, for January, we have alternate paths following GI fellowship. We have then in February complex IBD, uh, burnout in medicine and gastroenterology, which will be in April, intestinal motility disorders in May, diagnosis and management of pancreatic cyst in June. So we will have an ongoing webinar series, and we are very excited to have all of you start being participant in this. Uh, also, just uh, some uh, information, we have our sixth annual liver symposium starting every Thursday in January. Uh, but uh, there is, uh, uh, please uh, submit uh, abstract or case vignette now. The deadline is December 14. So if you have any of those, please submit it and try to attend uh, any of these um, sessions for our annual uh, liver symposium. And again, it's free of cost, it's virtual and it will be uh, at around uh, 5.30 to 7.30 in the evening. Lastly, I wanted to um, thank our educational committee um, and trainee committee, and this work cannot be possible with all the uh, fellows who are active. Uh, so Bianca, Chandra, uh, Leah, Jessica, Timothy, Mike, and Stephanie. Uh, and I also like to uh, thank Radhika and Robert as they are very For, uh, again, follow us on Twitter. Uh, well, I think you cut off there at first. Yeah, Joe, sorry. Uh, go ahead and share your screen and take it over. Sure. Thank you. All right. That projecting okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Joe Claro, like Bilal mentioned. I'm one of the transplant hepatologists here in SF. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about um, approaches to acute kidney injury in patients with cirrhosis, something that I find very fascinating, but not everyone does. So we'll try to make it interesting. Um, so we're going to talk about some definitions, demographics, diagnostics, and go through some of the therapeutics. Um, and where I start is usually to know where you're, you're going, you have to know where, you're st where you start. And so I bring that up because I find that the baseline is something we often overlook but I think is critical in how we approach acute kidney injury, especially in the hospital setting. And so it's typically defined as a baseline serum creatinine in outpatient when there's not these dynamic uh, uh, insults going on. Um, and it's usually about less than three months old and, and whether or not there's any pernuria is an important distinction. Um, I think that it's important because as we get into the definitions of acute kidney injury, you really have to start with the baseline to know if there's AKI. Um, and AKI really begins at a threshold that's much lower than what you'd expect. You know, beginning at about a serum creatinine increase of 0 0.3 in less than 48 hours or over 50% in seven days, um, that is really the threshold that we define as AKI. And as you can see from this graphic, there is both stage that's important. And so the first stage one being 0 0.3 up to doubling of your creatinine, stage two from doubling to tripling of your creatinine, and stage three as either starting dialysis or having uh, uh, more than tripling of your, your creatinine. And so the, the, you know, the first question is really is a cutoff of 0 0.3 uh, too low. And the answer is yes and no. Um, this was a study done of about 90 patients in the outpatient setting. Uh, 
um, that was done by Florence Wong's group that essentially they had a bunch of patients with decompensated cirrhosis and ascites and they measured their creatinine at set intervals. I think it was about every, uh, every month um, for, uh, for up to uh, two years. And what they found is that in patients who had this 0.3 increase in creatinine or these very small um, stage one episodes of acute kidney injury, the mortality different, uh, differed. And so the light gray bar is those who did not have AKI and the and dark gray bar is those who had AKI. And so you can see that even although the p-value is close to 0.05, these curves really separate. Um, and you know, it was just because of a small sample size that it wasn't more significant, but really it introduces that this threshold of 0 0.3 is important. Um, but really when you wanna talk about what's going to drive mortality in, in these patients, it's really about progression. Um, so this was a study from 2014 um, the definitions that I described are really just adapted from the akin criteria. And so what you can see here is that in patients with stage one AKI who were hospitalized with cirrhosis, those who had no progression only had a 2% mortality during that hospitalization, while those who progressed to either stage two, stage three, or dialysis had a progressive increase in their mortality during that hospitalization. Likewise, in those with stage two, if you progress to stage three or requiring dialysis, the mortality increased. And, and if, you were, if you had tripled your creatinine on admission then start on dialysis, that also had the highest mortality of 71%. So really it highlights that yes, 0.3 is where mortality starts, but our intervention should be really focused on preventing the progression. And so these findings have been validated in a number of, a number of clinical scenarios. So um, in hospitalized patients with ascites, in hospitalized patients with alcohol-associated hepatitis, outpatients that in the study I showed you with cirrhosis and ascites, hospitalized patients with an ascites and infection, and in outpatients uh, who had cirrhosis, ascites, and were getting large volume paracentesis. And so pretty much in all of our patients, this threshold has an impact on mortality. And, and, I, and I bring it up again, that early recognition is critical because if you really want to improve outcomes for these patients, you have to prevent the progression to the higher stages. But it's not that simple. You know, kidney dysfunction in cirrhosis patients arises from a broad spectrum of pathologies, including AKI from alterations in perfusions and hepatorenal syndrome to CKD from irreversible parenchymal damage. You know, with the, we'll talk about this in detail, but with NASH and uh, the greater burden of diabetes and metabolic syndrome, this is a bigger issue. And so should we care? Um, the different phenotypes actually have different impact on mortality. Um, this is a study we did a few years ago that showed that in patients awaiting a liver transplant, if you had normal kidney function or chronic kidney disease as compared to AKI or AKI on CKD, your mortality was about, was more than half. And so really the, the, the risk comes with the acute kidney injury and the, you know, all of the context of the medical uh, scenario that goes along with acute kidney injury. And we repeated this analysis in, in all comers, not including transplants. So this was a study using the national inpatient sample um, where we looked at uh, inpatients hospitalized with a diagnosis of cirrhosis. In addition, they had a code, uh, an ICD-9 code for uh, any of the kidney diagnoses, whether it was AKI, CKD, or AKI on CKD. We found that as compared to those with CKD, those with acute kidney injury had more than double the risk of mortality while they were in the hospital. Again, highlighting that these differences matter. And so off of this data, you would argue that a patient with a MELD of 30 with acute kidney injury has more than double the risk of dying as a patient with a MELD of 30 with chronic kidney disease. And, you know, this point is important because like I alluded to earlier, the burden of chronic kidney disease in our population is rising substantially. So in liver transplant patients uh, awaiting on the wait list, you know, the proportion of patients who had chronic kidney disease has more than doubled in the last decade. And likewise, in that same study I quoted earlier, if you look at inpatients hospitalized with cirrhosis, all of the codes for uh, kidney dysfunction are rising. So there's a greater burden of acute kidney injury that we're seeing in the hospital. 
a greater burden of chronic kidney disease that we're seeing in the hospital and a greater burden of acute on chronic kidney disease that we're seeing in the hospital. And why are these happening? You know, there is, this has kind of been starting to be teased apart in the literature, but first of all, patients with liver disease are getting older, whether it's the baby boomer age, uh, baby boomers progressing to older age, or, you know, liver disease and NAFLD happening later in life. The, the, there's an increased age in the majority of patients with cirrhosis. And so with that comes a greater burden of comorbidities. But, you know, with the emergence of NAFLD, this is becoming a bigger issue because of the metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. But in addition, even if you don't have hyperlipidemia, high, high blood pressure, diabetes, there are studies that show that there's some pro-fibrotic pathway in NASH that also drives fibrosis of the kidneys. And so even if there aren't these other complications, we're still seeing more uh, chronic kidney disease. And so, you know, the next question is, okay, so are they there, but are they related? And in the nephrology, nephrology literature, it's pretty clear that there's a relationship with AKI and CKD. Patients with chronic kidney disease are substantially higher, at higher risk for acute kidney injury. And patients with AKI, both the severity and the frequency of it are more likely to develop CKD. And this is, kind, this is coming to, uh, this has kind of been shown in the liver literature as well. Um, so this was a study that showed that based off of your baseline serum creatinine, even at a level of just about one, your risk of developing acute kidney injury was almost triple and your rates of persistent kidney injury, meaning that you're having that AKI progression and you're not recovering was also triple. Um, this was a study from the Florence Wong group that essentially showed the same thing. In patients, this, so this was in the Naxold consortium, so uh, seven or eight US centers, uh, North American centers, um, all transplant centers. Um, so in hospitalization outcomes. And so these, in this group, uh, there were patients without CKD, that was 194 patients and patients with CKD. And they showed that the rates of AKI when you were hospitalized were 68% in those with chronic kidney disease and 21% in those without chronic kidney disease. And they also nicely show that this increases as the stage of your chronic kidney disease worsens. So as compared to patients with you know, CKD stage three, where the rate of a I'm having trouble. Oh, sorry. Where the rate of AKI was 62%. In those with CKD stages four or five, the rates of AKI were about 80%. And so really just highlights that as you have less reserve and you have more chronic kidney disease, you're at substantially higher risk for acute kidney injury. And re earlier this year, we kind of showed uh, uh, the Barcelona group showed that the opposite is true. And patients who are hospitalized with acute kidney injury are at higher risk of developing chronic kidney disease. So what they did was take up 409 patients, 168 who were hospitalized with AKI and 241 who were hospitalized without acute kidney injury. And what they found was that three months, 25% of those who were hospitalized with acute kidney injury had chronic kidney disease, while only 1% of those who were hospitalized without acute kidney injury had developed CKD. And the risk factors for developing chronic kidney disease after a patient leaves the hospital, whereas if the, it was a hospital acquired acute kidney injury and the severity of the acute kidney injury. Um, but it also highlights that the, to the point I made earlier about progression is that the transition from AKI to CKD was associated with an increased rate of three month hospital readmission. And we've all seen these in our patients with chronic kidney disease and ascites that inevitably they get an episode of AKI and get readmitted. And it, uh, there was an increased frequency of AKI, kind of highlighting the points I showed earlier that as you develop CKD, you're more prone for acute kidney injury, um, that they had higher rates of bacterial infections, ascites, that they, we, they couldn't tolerate diuretics. And so they had developed refractory ascites. And there was a trend in the study, that, um, albeit, albeit small, um, that, that they required more um, liver transplantation. And so I think this, body of work shows that these things are related and unfortunately things aren't as simple as just calling something acute kidney injury and we really need to tease apart what's chronic and therefore irreversible and what's acute and therefore reversible. And so this is kind of what I get at in this figure where I, and why I started with the baseline creatinine because you know as I've said a few times now that those most likely to have AKI, AKI progression are those with chronic kidney disease 
And so if you, and typically how I approach AKI in the hospital setting is kind of trying to understand how much of this acute kidney injury I can reverse and get back to a baseline, wherever that baseline may be, and how much uh, is irreversible and I need to you know, plan whether it's uh, the appropriate strategy. So in this figure, the dark box is what is considered chronic kidney disease and therefore reversible. The light box or the white box is considered AKI and therefore reversible. And, you know, and kind of with medical intervention, what can we expect in terms of reversibility um, and outcomes there? Okay, so in that framework, in that context, um, we can transition to uh, hepatorenal syndrome, AKI, or what was formerly known as HRS type one. Um, so this, in the last two years or so, there have been a change in the nomenclature a bit. Um, the diagnostic criteria are very similar in the sense that patients have to have cirrhosis or acute liver failure or ACLF. Um, there needs to be an increase in serum creatinine, like we talked about earlier, of 0 0.3 within 48 hours or, more, or greater than 50% um, in seven days, and or there needs to be oliguria. Patients have to be trialed on some sort of resuscitation, typically with albumin with, for 48 hours for an improvement. There cannot be shock. There cannot be nephrotoxic drugs. Um, there should be some description of lack of parenchymal damage in the sense of no pertinuria, no hematuria. Um, we'll talk about biomarkers in a few minutes um, and, there, and with normal renal ultrasound. What I will argue though, is that in the vast majority of patients with CKD, many of them won't, will have chronic kidney disease, but won't meet this criteria. Um, and then, and lastly, the, the FINA threshold of there being um, a low serum sodium or a low FINA. And so, but even in this nomenclature, they're working towards ident of highlighting the differences between AKI and CKD. And so what was nor formally known as HRS type two has now been broken down into um, HRS and AKI, and from there, HRS AKD, which stands for acute kidney dysfunction, and HRS CKD, which is chronic kidney disease. These are the same thing. It's just the amount of time that's needed to transition the chronic kidney disease is 90 days. And so in the kidney literature, this period of not knowing if somebody will persist with a low GFR for 90 days has been called this acute kidney dysfunction period. And then when it formally hits three months, then it's, it's transitioned to CKD um, for the purposes of research. Um, and you know this I highlight because HRS AKI is complicated. Um, this was a very nice review that I will quote a, a couple of slides from, but really it just highlights all the different pathways that are affected in HRS. You know, uh, everything from cardiovascular to uh, this hyperinflammatory state to the ha classic hepatorenal physiology that we describe of, you know, hypotension, presence of ascites. And one of the really critical findings and that's seen on ultrasound and invasive imaging and angiography is there's decreased blood flow to the renal cortexes. And so that is what's thought that the, pre the perfusion pressures drop. And it's really the, uh, the cortex of the kidney that gets poor perfusion that's thought to drive the majority of, uh, of the physiology behind HRS AKI. And, you know, to kind of recognizing that this is complicated, and also we all know in clinical practice, this is much more complicated because patients take medications, patients have infections that you're clearing up that you know, a lot of things are going on. And so there's been a lot of work in terms of biomarker research to try to make it easier for us. And the most promising of which is probably uh, urine NGAL, which is a, a neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin. Fancy way of saying that they ligated the renal arteries on a bunch of mice, measured different proteins that formed in the urine. And the first one that came up was NGAL. It's, a, it's released from neutrophils and it's, a, and, and it's been shown to be associated with acute kidney injury in a lot of different scenarios. 
But in the cirrhosis population, um, it showed that it, the, the levels vary depending on the etiology. They're lowest in pre-renal AKI, they're at a moderate level in hepatorenal syndrome, and that they're the highest in acute tubular necrosis. And so uh, the Barcelona group has also probably done the most amount of work with NGAL, and, I, and it, there, some of their sites will use this in practice, or at least their manuscripts sound like it. Um, and what they do is essentially, if your NGAL levels over this threshold of 194, then it's much more likely to be acute tubular necrosis. And therefore they try to correct that and they don't usually use terlopressin as a first line agent. However, if it's this intermediate range and didn't re respond to volume resuscitation, then, it, then they treat it as if it were HRS and kind of use that to guide their judgment, especially in those clinical scenarios that are hard to tease apart. That being said, you know, these have been the first study on NGAL was probably six or seven years ago now, um, and, and none are really used in clinical practice or available for prime time. And so whether or not they will be fully introduced, I am, I'm not convinced. But so we talked about making this diagnosis of HRS AKI. Um, and, and I think I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time now talking about the treatments. Um, and so they're listed in this table are all the trials that have been done for, uh, for any vasoactive agent for uh, HRS AKI. What the first point I wanna highlight is that the reversal rates of HRS in all of these studies are highly variable. You know, we have some studies that report rates of response as high as 75 to 78 response, albeit these were in uncontrolled studies, but you know, these same numbers are present in the lower part of controlled studies to you know, other studies with the same treatment that only had rates of 34 to 24%. And this highlights that these studies did a really bad job of, of defining their study group probably for a lot of the reasons that I highlighted earlier that, you know, teasing apart what is we actually treating, how much of it's chronic and how much is it acute is really difficult to tease apart in clinical practice. And so, you know, that I think that plays a big role in, in what our expectations are when we're giving any treatment. And so, you know, what you can see that has been tried in terms of vasoactive agents are midodrine and octreotide, as we know, terlopressin, um, norepinephrine, and those are the and those are the big studies. And there was one study that just used octreotide alone, which didn't seem to have much effect. And to kind of highlight the point I made earlier about how different people were enrolled in all of these studies, if if you just look at their mean baseline serum creatinine at enrollment, so before treatment, you can see that the starting points in these studies were highly variable. You know, some people started at a creatinine of 2.2 or 1.8 and other groups, they were as high as five. And so you can see, you can, we are catching people at different parts of the disease progression. We are not getting a good sense of what their baseline is. And that's what's led to a lot of the confusion in terms of what are the most efficacious treatments. And another point that I'll make is that we're also not catching them at the same degree of liver disease. And so what you will see in one of the points I want to highlight in terms of when you're looking for a response for uh, HRS AKI is that the bilirubin is actually really informative. In patients with higher bilirubin levels, whether it's because the you know, bile acids are causing you know, a bile acid nephropathy or that they're just so sick with acute and chronic liver failure that there are many other progressive hits that are going on, the higher the bilirubin level, the less the response that's expected with uh, any vasoactive agent in general. And that's kind of what's highlighted here where you can see in these studies um, at the bottom where the billies were 15 and 16, the response rates were much lower. They were 34 and 13 and, and likewise when 12 and 11. And so it's just an important, important point that these, these studies are all starting at different phases of disease and and because of that, we're not really sure what works best. And that gets to the most recent confirmed trial. So this was the third trial, randomized trial of terlopressin in the United States looking for, uh, for approval to be able to use. 
Um, the study design was a little bit complicated in the sense that patients were resuscitated for two days and then they were then they went back in their charts and looked for a couple things. They wanted to make sure they were on no prior vasoactive agents, that they had received no nephrotoxic medications, that they weren't currently infected. And if on the retrospective review, everything looked okay, then they were randomized two to one to either terlipressin, IV, or placebo. Um, and then there was a little bit of a dose, uh, uh, cha changes in the dose that they randomized there as well. Uh, and also a decision about whether to continue or not at, at four days after randomization. And, oh, sorry, my slides got, I'll come back to that one, I apologize. Um, and so, you know, this study sounded really promising when it was presented. Um, you know, this was the slide, the abstract slide from ASLD, I think not this past one, the one prior. Um, and the outcomes, they, they met them and their outcomes were pretty stringent. And so that's what was so promising in that the, you know, the first one, the primary endpoint, uh, which was verified HRS reversal, meaning that they had patients do a chart review, they reviewed the chart and yes, the HRS improved. And there was a significant improvement in outcomes. Patients, um, you know, uh, with terlipressin ha had uh, a 29% re uh, response versus 16%, which was significant. Um, the second outcome, which was uh, just a uh, creatinine-based, uh, lab-based HRS reversal, likewise was significant. The durability of response, meaning patients not needing to recur as well as not starting dialysis was higher in the terlipressin group. Um, and then, and, but there was no significant change in uh, transplant-free survival, or et cetera. So there were, you know, they concluded that there were these really marked improvements in kidney function, that they were empowered to look at mortality. And so that's why they didn't. Um, and overall, they, they conclude that terlipressin was, uh, was more effective than placebo. Um, placebo in this arm was just albumin. There was no other vasoactive agents and that we'll talk about in a second. If you had gotten any other vasoactive agent, meaning you're in the ICU, you were randomized to placebo, but you got started on levofed in the ICU, you were then not qualified for the study. And so this brings up to why it wasn't approved by the FDA. So this is the safety data that they presented. And you can tell, oh, you can tell right away that terlipressin had much higher rates of respiratory failure Abdominal pain was expected, but the 10% rate of uh, requiring vent, uh, in respiratory failure was not expected and much higher than prior studies. Um, and then they had higher rates of sepsis, uh, multiple, multiple organ dysfunction and syndrome. And this is why I highlighted the, how they chose their study about the other vasoactive agents, because you know there's really no reason why a patient in the placebo arm shouldn't have any sepsis if they're hospitalized with decompensated cirrhosis. But you can tell between the respiratory failure and the sepsis, it probably had something to do with how they handled the vasoactive agents and how they excluded people in the sense that they made their treatment arm a lot sicker than their placebo arm. And so that's why, uh, but because of this data, that's why the FDA has, uh, has, has put uh, terlipressin on hold and then they have a review, I think, in a few months, and uh, we'll see what happens. But the point I want to make and how we'll transition this from here, um, because I know terlipressin is always the hot topic, is that most of the data suggests that terlipressin is no different than levofed. And we'll talk about why that is. But this was kind of the best study. It's a meta-analysis. There's a lot of variability in, how, in each of the studies. So it's not the strongest meta-analysis. But you can just tell that from each of the studies and then the overall hazard ratio that it's pretty dead in the center. And so unlikely that there's a really added benefit of terlipressin versus norepinephrine. But, you know, that's, but that is up for debate. And, you know, there are other studies, including one in hepatology that came out after this meta-analysis that would suggest otherwise. Um, but that was in acute on chronic liver failure patients. So in general, I just tend to keep it simple. I figure out what the baseline is. I remove the precipitating event. I resuscitate with albumin for 48 hours. If they're on the floor, I start midodrin and octreotide. If they're in the ICU, I start norepinephrine. And the treatment goal is really simple. You want to increase their MAP and the goal is 15. So this is a nice study that shows that um, 
the correlation between as you increase someone's map, as in the seven day change in map on the X axis to the seven day increase in serum creatinine on the left axis, on the Y axis. And you can see very clearly that as the map comes up, the, the creatinine comes down. And so it's all about improving perfusion by getting, uh, increasing the blood pressure. And so your treatment goals are a MAP increase of greater than 15 millimeters of mercury. And those who respond tend to respond in the first three days. And so, um, and so that's kind of how I frame it. And if it's not happening at three days, you know, then it's unlikely that people are going to respond. So this is a very long-winded case that I won't read through all entirely, but essentially it's a 62-year-old guy, hep C, decompensated cirrhosis, MAP, that, a blood pressure that's 87 over 42, creatinine at baseline is 0 0.3, comes in with a creatinine of, uh, where is it? I apologize, 1.5, um, is clearly decompensated, and uh, all of his metrics suggest that he has hepatorenal syndrome. And so kind of a flow um, that I would, I think about in practice is this, you know, get through the history, remove the offending agents, get through the volume expansion. If the creatinine is decreasing, great. Then you have your pre-renal diagnosis. You don't need any more. If the creatinine is increasing then it, and it's unresponsive, then I get, I kind of do a little more detective work in terms of looking at the urine, making sure there's no other etiologies that are there. If it fits a possible HRS syndrome, then I'm going to start some sort of vasoactive agents, floor, metadrenotriotide, ICU, norepinephrine. And, and my goal is to increase the MAP and prevent progression, like we talked about earlier. The more progression, the worse the outcomes. And so really just trying to act early and to prevent it from progressing to some to more serious um, uh, AKI. And then, then about stopping is a question that always comes up. So if they're responding, I usually do it for four to seven days until the until there's a nadir in the creatinine. And I'm patient with it. If it, you know, it's usually 24 hours. And then if it's stable after 24 hours, then I'll start peeling off. Um, if and then like I talked about earlier. If there's no response in two to three days, then I also I only leave them on the vasoactive agents if they're on it for another reason. Um, and then the one point I will make is that once it happens once, like we talked about, every hit of AKI plays a factor. And once it happens once, there's always a chance it happens again. And so, and so keeping that in mind that it can always recur. And you know, the only point I want to make here is that how does your expectations of the first patient change if his baseline creatinine was 0 0.5 uh, as it was before, or 1.4 if, if we change it? You can see right away that your expectations of what kind of renal recovery you're looking for is really different. And that's what I think is important. And so I'll leave you with this, um, this diagram that I've made here, um, that essentially that you know, there are opportunities for prevention before the AKI happens. Knowing the baseline will probably inform what kind of recovery there is and if there's reversibility, that there's a therapeutic window and it's early. And that's why we care about that 0 0.3 threshold. Um, and then we talked about the things that we can do to reverse. Um, and so with that, I think that's everything I have. Thank you so much, Joe. That was amazing. Uh, and uh, thanks for everyone else who were listening. Uh, so uh, let's start uh, some of the question uh, first from Aaron, that how long do you monitor a patient on octrodite and midodrine before ex escalation to norep or, you know, the patient's on the floor and do you just transfer a patient, I feel like, you know, to the ICU? And that's a very important and very uh, good question. Yeah, for sure. You know, the, that's why I spent so much time talking about all the study design differences, because, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to tease apart from the data, which is more effective, that if you're able to get that increase in MAP with that midodrine octreotide, in theory, it should be just as effective. I'll tell you in practice, it's unlikely you're going to be able to do that. And so what I would, you know, what 
often the ICU decisions dictated by this clinical scenario. So we have to understand that. But in theory, if you want the best outcome, if you're unable to get that increase in MAP within 48 hours, then there really should be a thought of moving towards, you know, an ICU and being able to get levofed. You know, there are some centers that actually have a protocol to give norepinephrine on the floor. Um, and it's where it's, and, and so there is some value in being able to titrate a medication up to get the appropriate increase in MAP that you might not be able to get with midodrine. Um, and so I think that that is kind of my threshold that, that if we're not hitting at, you know, 24, 48 hours and things are progressing, um, then, you know, I kind of try to push for an earlier transition to IV uh, vaso vasoactive agents. So uh, on, along the same line, uh, what do you do with, uh, once you uh, give them uh, the uh, IV albumin early on based on it, but after that you continue the IV albumin, what dose do you use is, or, and when mm -hmm. stop it, if there is some serum albumin, there is some new data coming out with that. So what do you do with IV albumin after the challenge? Yeah. Yeah, you know, all the again, all the protocols are a little bit different. In in general, it's usually about you know one every uh, one twenty five percent bottle every uh, eight hours. The the British group is looking into thresholds of three or three and a half. Um, I'm I, I'm off the top of my head. I don't remember all of that data, um, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I, I think that it wasn't as promised. Titrating to an albumin goal in general wasn't as promising as they thought it would be. Mm -hmm. um, and so these people are almost always hypotensive or are always getting, um, you know, there's extra fluid shifts, et cetera. So I'm usually leaving it on, um, but, you know, definitely an albumin three, three and a half, it's probably not adding much and just wow. treating ourselves. Okay, excellent. So a uh, question from Robert, uh, in patients who has AKI who demonstrate improvement in the kidney function after uh, following your algorithm, what's your approach to restart diuretics in those with ascites? Yeah, so slow and steady uh, and very low. Um, so, you know, the problem is, although we want to get them back on the diuretics, when they develop the chronic kidney disease, they're inevitably going to get into a very vicious cycle, as we've all seen. And so once we get people at a baseline, in theory, what uh, I give them like a 24 to 48 hour period off of the midodrine octreotide or just the midodrine alone, see where they settle and then maybe introduce, you know, very sl slowly half of, if not a quarter of what their home dose was, depending on what they came in on. And I watch them there for a day um, because, you know, often once this happens once, like I mentioned, it can recur. Um, and it's just going to be that then they'll go home for five days, get the diuretics each of those five days, and then start the whole, uh, be a much worse cycle. I think the point is that, you know, intervening early is a lot easier than intervening late and the impact and the reversibility is a lot easier earlier than late. So there are two questions. Uh, first is from the inpatient management that a lot of our colleagues are not the primary services, right? They consult and are GI fellows and these patients are managed by medicine hospitalist team. And there is an urge to discharge on like, you know, patients very quickly and it's get frustrating for the fellows, right? So uh, again, uh, that is, I know that there's no right answer, but what's your approach or what would you uh, have them say? Um, I try to be very uh, direct uh, with them and let them know that the risk is really high, um, that, you know, in the long run, the readmission rate would, it, you know, we know from that Barcelona study that I quoted, that if they develop, uh, uh, sorry, let me just find it here, mm -hmm. if they develop AKD, the rates of, uh, the rates of readmission are much higher. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, there's an urge to get people out, but in truth, being patient with it is actually probably um, going to be more, you know, re prevent readmissions in the long run um, because the recurrence rates as you develop CKD are so high. Mm. And so I, I think that if there is pressure to leave though, close monitoring is really important. Um, and, you know, having a creatinine within a week afterwards is, is also important. Okay. And I think this is an amazing paper. And for the fellows, if they needed to, I think this would be a paper 
hit to read for sure. Uh, one other question is uh, now these patients have refractory ascites, they have a paterenal syndrome and they have tense abdomen and they want a paracentesis. So what would you recommend uh, for the fellows that, you know, either they have to do it or someone is asking them how much is safe and when do you do it? Is there any, <laughs> sorry to ask these questions, but- I mean, Yeah, thanks for all the <laughs> questions. You know, there are no answers to. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, there's no exact threshold. I kind of, you know, I, I think in, what's important with LVPs is to build up to it. You know, you, we all have had those people who can tolerate 10 liters taken off, but we have also seen the people who can only tolerate one or two and kind of, you know, personalizing it for the, for the person is important and making sure that they get albumin. You know, I tend to be more proactive with the albumin during LVPs than others. And I'm usually saying more than three, I'm usually giving some albumin with them though. You know, like we alluded to earlier, the data for that is probably not very strong and, um, and it's kind of evolving. But, you know, I, I do think taking a personalized approach for each person in terms of LVPs is important. Right. And this is a common question I know that I've been asked. So Tom did ask this question about the, you know, beta blocker in these and should they be stopped on patient on it? So, you know. Yeah, um, this has gone back and forth a little bit, but I, I think that, and it's, and it's in here with this cardiac output. Um, essentially, once your map is dropping, there is some thought that you are really reliant on your uh, the cardiac reflex to be able to perfuse your kidneys. And so in these patients with LVPs, um, especially if they have low MAPs at baseline, um, then, then I'm, I, actually, I will pull it off. There is also that other phenotype that we've all seen that are the patients who are hypertensive, who have ascites but have chronic kidney disease. And in those people, I'm not as proactive in removing it. But in the people who have a low MAP at baseline, who uh, you know likely don't have the cardiac reserve as others, then I'm very uh, cautious with uh, beta blockers and, the, and those with refractory ascites. Uh, is there a role for midotrine as an outpatient? You know. I, I think so. There's not a great outpatient study that's randomized people to uh, metadrine or not metadrine. I think that it is one of the preventative strategies if we are hypothesizing that MAP plays such a big role in these. I do think that if you can augment someone's MAP a little bit with metadrine, in theory, it should help. Um, and maybe it can help decrease, you know, there's some, some people who believe that maybe it could decrease ascites too by increasing perfusion. And, you know, that's a lot of hand waving logic that I don't know if has ever been proven. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I think that once someone's on Minadrin, the chances of you being able to take that part of the treatment off is very low. Sending somebody home with octreotide, obviously, and the injection is not possible. But, mm -hmm. um, but once someone is on Minadrin, I'm usually sending them home with it. Okay. And uh, so, one other question, if the fellow sees this patient in a clinic or the nurse called them and the creatinine is up 0.3 from the baseline. And so how would they approach it? They are on diuretics, they are getting paracentesis about the timing for admission, right? That's the other big yeah. question that we, yeah. we all face it all the time and we don't know, but how would you approach it? Yeah, and, and, and that's why I started this was, is this threshold too low? And I, I think that we make the point that the threshold's important in, in recognizing that something is happening and that we have to intervene. So whether that is stopping diuretics mm -hmm. or spacing out LVPs or, uh, you know, thinking of what other medications are there or what might, you know, are they taking NSAIDs, whatever it might be, it's, a, it's, it's the threshold that I use to pay more attention. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I pay more attention, then I... Um, and then, then the threshold on admission is a lot harder. Usually it's, I try to make an intervention. If it goes the right way, great, I, I, I feel better. If, it go, if it's progressively getting worse, then that's when it's moving towards, okay, are they, do they have an infection or do they have to you know, get evaluated for that? And so um, it, it's kind of my, it's just my threshold to pay attention, I think. Um, and then I kind of, depending on how people respond to simple interventions, decide on admission. Okay, excellent. Uh, does anyone has any question? If they don't, you're free, uh, 
feel free to just ask, unmute, and you can also ask uh, Joe any question. There is one question by Sandeep is, if there is no improvement after one to two weeks with liver fat nor a P2 week, consider these patients to be listed for two, uh, liver kidney or simultaneous or it's still yeah. about eight weeks of worsening renal failure. Yeah, so th you know this has changed recently mm -hmm. um, and where we have set criteria. Um, for acute kidney injury, it's six weeks of a GFR less than 30. Um, and so, you know, if it goes on for six weeks of, uh, for uh, hepatorenal syndrome, then we'll consider liver kidney. You know, this is kind of gets to my point earlier of how complicated this is, is because, you know, our threshold had not been standardized. The rates of simultaneous liver kidney uh, transplants were going through the roof. And so we at least have set a new, in the last two years, a new criteria for this. Um, and so that's our threshold is six weeks of, of it, how, how long it needs to persist for acute kidney injury. And then for a chronic kidney disease, it has to be 90 days with a final GFR less than 30. That being said, you know, I was just on service last week and we had somebody who met that uh, six week criteria was in the operating room for the liver part of the transplant. While she was in the operating room, she decided to start making urine. And so they canceled the kidney transplant. And so clearly, um, our ability to and our tools to distinguish these things are still not up to par. And so um, that's just a long winded answer of saying six weeks is our current threshold. It'll probably change as we develop better, more sophisticated ways of knowing who needs a dual kidney, a uh, liver kidney, or who just needs a liver alone. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Joe, for your time. Thanks. To all the uh, attendees, it was a great participation. Uh, Anyone has any question, uh, you know, we still have a few seconds before we let Joe go. Uh, you will get an email from uh, Danny about the post uh, uh, evaluation and for the fellows, I didn't see anyone eating, but if someone has it, please get your $30. So <laughs> we're very excited. And again, we are very happy with our sponsors and our especially our trainee committee and educational, and we would love to have more fellows join this committee. And thank you for our executive uh, committee to give us the opportunity